host, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and this week I am joined by pretty much the core group of Corpse Club. Uh, we're a few people down, but uh, it is our end-of-year horror episode, and we figured why not round up the troops uh, as much as we could for this one. And so for this week's episode, I am joined by Scott Drebbit, Patrick Bromley, Derek Anderson, and last but certainly not least, Jonathan James, as we talk about our favorite horror movies of 2019. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but this is a pretty crappy year for horror, I'm I'm guessing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't feel like we have a lot to talk about uh, tonight. Of course, I'm kidding. Um, It was actually a pretty outstanding year for horror, whether you're looking at studio releases, indie horror, um, things that went straight to streaming, things that came out straight to DVD, Um, Blu-ray. where everywhere you turned, we had some really good stuff coming our way, which I feel like we were incredibly spoiled. And I don't know when this is going to end, um, but I feel like we should relish the moment while we're we're in the middle of it, because I don't know if we're going to keep having it as good as we've had it this year and even last year as well. I yeah, totally least- agree. This is one of easily one of the best horror years we've had. I mean, this will go down as an all timer. Um, and we thought last year was good, but um, but so many surprises this year. And uh, and not, not studio stuff either. Just a lot of great indie stuff, a lot of great foreign stuff. Yeah, I remember going to the theater like it seemed like for the whole summer I was going to the theater uh, every couple of weeks seeing double features just to keep up because I think we had like an eight or nine week stretch where maybe like with a one week break in there somewhere where it seemed like a major horror movie was coming out every single Friday. So it just to me, it almost felt like the greatest summer of horror that at least I've been around for but it's it's i'm hoping that that continues i know we have like four horror movies to start off 2020 but 2019 is gonna be hard to top when you yeah, say like you're you're going like your your movie going to space was that like the last like 10 years or so like <laughs> 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 yeah since i've been able to go see movies on my own basically uh yeah since, you, so. since, since your mom and dad were like all right Derek, you can go ahead look i've been able to do this for so long so i'm gonna take my shots while i can um obviously we like to Raz Derek a little bit because he's young, but it's just because we envy your youth and, mm. and your vigor. So, you know, us old folks here as we mm-hmm. inch towards the coffin closer and closer. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's <laughs> definitely been a lot of fun. Yeah, I know. Um, just in terms of when we were putting together our best of our favorites of 2019 list, I was stunned that it was really a volume quality year. Um, last year was really good. I think this year was even better. Just the amount of, you know, good or really good movies that there, there were, it was, um, yeah, Jonathan's right. It, I think it's a banner year for sure. Excellent. Well, I guess we could just jump in there. Um, so for this episode, everybody that's listening, we're going to both, we're, we're both, I'm so used to just being <laughs> horror BFF. Sorry, sorry, everybody else. Um, but we're going to kind of go around and talk wow, about our I got, got you, favorites. I got you, Heather. Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. Um, no favorites here. <laughs> so you just tell us which of your favorite, which of your favorite horror BFFs you have, um, and we'll go from there. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I think uh, we, we'll go ahead and start with you, Scott. If you want to sort of start us off, we're going to each kind of go through our two favorite, favorite, favorites. Um, which you know, it's like picking your favorite kids. So good luck, everybody. Oh boy. Come on, Ma. Jeez. Um, okay. Favorite, favorite, favorites. Um, I think my first one will be uh, Loose from uh, Germany. And uh, have you guys seen it? Yeah, it's my. It, it is actually yeah. my favorite movie. Really? No, actually, that is stellar. It, it was actually one of my favorites out of uh, Fantastic Fest the year before. I wanted right. more. I wanted like ten minutes more of it. Mm. But the 70 minutes we get is fantastic. It is this Tillman singer. This is a really this whole this movie, like you said, 70 minutes. It's a calling card um, for his talent. He compresses in that 70 minutes such atmosphere, uh, mood, uh, tone that's sustained through the whole movie. And it's really ingenious because there's basically only two settings but within those two settings, he manages to do so much with so little. Um, I just thought it was amazing. 
Yeah, this and is that, a real surprise uh, for me because I saw it in Fantastic Fest as well. And um, yeah, I mean, it looks like, I mean, I, it, it, you, you kind of like do a double take and are like, is this a movie I missed when I started watching it? Because I really didn't know anything about it going in to see it. I just heard it was it was worth my time. And um, it looks so great on 16 millimeter. I mean, it gives it this like aged feel and he takes such time in setting this up. Whereas, you know, this could have been right with another director could have done it as a as a short film. Um, and some people uh, will take their short films and kind of like stretch them out. And it feels like, um, you know, like like it didn't need to be a feature. Um, but I think that, uh, that this team took the right amount of time to tell this like really interesting possession film um, in a way that feels fresh, even though it feels like something from the past. Can I can I can I interject really quick? Do you mean Overlook? No, I saw it at uh, at Fantastic Fest. Or, oh, Fantastic Fest! Oh my God, I saw it at uh, Fantasia. <laughs> I was like, I was like, when the hell were you? You at know Fantastic? what happened, Heather? I <laughs> snuck in for like one day, and while yeah. you were at Fantastic Fest, and you know what? My brain kind of flipped too, because when you said Fantastic Fest, I'm like, when was she there? Like, did she That's get a what screener? I was, thinking, I was like, when the hell was he there? <laughs> yeah, it was at Fantasia. Like, don't, be, don't be invading my turf. Yeah, it was Damn. Fantasia. Yeah, you stay out of Fantasia. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> Battle lines have been dropped. I was yes. like, wait a minute. Like, look, I'm 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 old and I forget things. That's 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 clearly a thing, but I was like, wait a minute. When the hell did he go to Fantastic Fest and why no. wouldn't he have said anything? Like we're all in one theater. Yeah, no, I, I snuck in and I didn't tell you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Fantasia <laughs> makes way more sense. Yes. <laughs> Always watching. And didn't didn't lose. Didn't that start out as like a student film or something like that, where it it, it, it was, was like, a student film. It was a student thesis. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'd say they got an A. <laughs> I mean, I think he passed. I think I remember asking yeah. him because I interviewed him, and I oh, think yeah. he at least passed. So <laughs> I would hope. Yeah, no, that was that was a really fun one, um, and I'm, it's nice that it's on Shutter finally. Um, I didn't really consider it for 2019 because I don't really know quite what the re- the actual I'm I'm a I'm a release date sort of I think stickler. June. I think June for the US was the official release. Okay. According I mean, to I, IMDB. Yeah. Well, you know, if the internet it's on the internet, it's it's definitely accurate. <laughs> um, which I found out a lot when I was doing my January piece because I was like, Oh, look at all these great movies that came out in January. And like, well, technically it was Sundance. And I was like, Oh, that doesn't count. Oh um, yeah. But, oh, uh, just but, just ask Derek, he'll never He'll never correct you for the proper year when we're doing these episodes. Oh, um, wonderful. It was that episode <laughs> where Scott talked about one that he thought was in the right year and it wasn't. We had to cut it out. They were uh, two episodes. <laughs> Sorry, two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the, uh, one, the one I didn't check. What can you do? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I just don't remember. Like, It, it must have just kind of came and went and like didn't realize it. or maybe it went straight to VOD. But I am glad it's on Shutter now. So for anybody listening, and if you haven't had a chance to watch it on Shutter, and you have Shutter, which you should, um, cheap plug, uh, mm. you should definitely uh, check it out. That's it's it's a really good time, especially if you're sort of into retroy dem- uh, demonic horror. So, and who isn't? Who isn't? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So uh, Patrick, what were what was one of your favorites for uh, 2019? Um, my very favorite I'm not going to name because I know it's going to be named by somebody else uh, on the show so I'm going to go with um, Daniel Isn't Real from writer, director Dan, uh, Adam Egypt Mortimer <clears throat> this is his second what film what a name by after- the way right <laughs> Adam Egypt yeah. Mortimer you can really only direct films if your name is Adam Egypt Mortimer uh, it's such a badass name. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's his only career path. He had made a movie called Some Kind of Hate that I thought had some really interesting ideas uh, and was well directed. But I didn't think all the ideas were executed as well as I wanted them to be. There was a lot of stuff about like cutting and bullying. Um, and it seemed like a, a really interesting horror movie for our times. And it never quite came together the way I wanted it to. So it was really great to see Daniel isn't real and see him just knock it out of the park. Um, it's a wild movie about a, a guy who had an imaginary friend when he was a kid, locked him up for years. And then as an adult, his imaginary friend is released and begins to wreak havoc on his life. And it's a really kind of psychedelic movie 
um, has a lot to say about, you know, depression and mental illness and, um, all of his themes come together in a much more satisfying way. I thought it was really wild, really moving, incredibly confidently directed. Uh, I just thought it was really, really fantastic. Yeah, it took some really unexpected turns. Like when I was watching it, I, I saw it at Popcorn Frights Fest and uh, and he was down there kind of presenting the movie and everything. And but it was uh, the it, it almost makes me think it was going to be one thing and then completely turned into something else in the second half, which I really love those tonal shifts mm-hmm. and the whole imagination fantasy aspect of it. I thought was really cool. So it, it kind of threw me for a loop because I really thought, OK, I know what this is and then realized, oh, wait, I have no idea what this is. And I love that when a movie does that to you. Definitely. Yeah, I'm honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I'm just when it comes to festival movies, like I need like a name to grab me. And while I was excited about Miles Robbins, because I think uh, Dave was one of the best parts of Halloween 2018. Uh, rest in peace, Dave. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really excited about Mary Stuart Masterson because yeah. I am easy when it comes to some kind of wonderful cast members. <laughs> um, so I was just like, oh, my God, yes, this is going to be my favorite movie ever. And it, it, it was great. Like, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I really had because I actually got to talk to the three of them. I got to talk to Miles, Patrick Schwarzenegger and. Um, Adam Egypt Mortimer, such a fun name to say, um, at South by and just like Adam actually had his look book with him and you, he like talked me through some of like his process. And I was really fascinated. Like there's sometimes where you like, you're watching a director and you're like, okay, they had an idea going into it. And I think it sort of shaped itself as they went along. And I don't get the sense of that with, with Daniel isn't real at all. Like this guy clearly had a vision and it really comes through in the final product. Um, and it's, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, you know, and it's not to say that you always have to be as prepared. I think sometimes, you know, cool things can happen spontaneously. Um, but like, I just think that there's something really, really interesting about what he had to say with that movie, especially these days. Um, because I think, you know, uh, it's interesting that people haven't been more in arms, if you will, about sort of the messaging of that movie versus other movies that sort of say similar things but have a different viewpoint, if you get my drift. Mm, yes. Mm. I haven't seen I haven't seen it yet, but um, you said the name Miles Patrick Schwarzenegger, and I was picturing this giant Viking um, oh, no, it was Miles like, and Patrick Schwarzenegger. Yeah, but I heard Miles Patrick Schwarzenegger, and I thought that's just as cool of a name. Everybody After, should have three names now. Right? And it's like the offspring of Miles O'Keefe and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's just a 400 uh, muscle-bound uh, Viking. He d- He's dressed as Duran Duran the whole movie from Barbarella, but he does the vocal okay. stylings of Mr. Freeze from Batman and Robin. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how I would sum it up, too. Yes, I, I definitely got some Mr. Freeze vibes from that performance. I, I thought you were going to yeah. say the vocal stylings of uh, Thor, the heavy metal singer. Oh, sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> oh, all right. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to jump in with with your first pick? Sure. Um, so some people may have seen this movie years ago, um, and I just kept missing it um, when I would go to festivals. Um, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Uh, One Cut of the Dead, um, which was uh, released stateside uh, via Shudder this year. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorite movies, so I'm talking about it now. Um, but there's just, uh, an incredible amount of love, um, that's put into this movie. It's not as much of a horror movie or a zombie movie as it is a a comedy and a movie about filmmaking. Um, but it's hard not to fall in love with it again, whether you're a fan of any of that stuff, it's, um, it's, uh, from writer director Shinichiro Ueda and, um, and I don't want to give a lot of it away, but it uh, they kind of put their own spin on the, you know, uh, one cut format and uh, do some different things with it. Um, but, you know, it's it's, it's super easy, um, you know, for, for me anyway, to get burnt out on zombie movies. Um, we see, you know, since The Walking Dead, tons of people have um, just, you know, tried to uh, I'll make this zombie movie. It's exactly like everything else. Uh, uh, excuse me, exactly like everything else that I've seen. And, um, you know, so it takes something special to stand out. 
about. So um, Train to Busan and uh, and One Cut of the Dead are, are some of the best zombie movies I've seen in years. And uh, have you guys checked it out? I have. It's absolutely one of my favorite movies of the year. I didn't include it on my list for Daily Dead just because, as you said, as you were starting out, it's not really – it's about the making of a horror movie while not necessarily being a horror movie. So I kept it off my list, but it is one of the best movies I've ever seen about filmmaking and what it means to come together to create something as a group of people. And uh, I absolutely love it. Great pick. It was in my, it was, I had it in my honorable uh, mentions. And the only reason it was in there, even though I still really, really dug it was I, I found the, middle section kind of uh lost me a little bit um but having said that the way the the third act is is brilliant and some of my favorite filmmaking of the year it's just that middle act kind of kind of lost me um a little bit but it, it's it's a, still a great movie i still need to see this one so this will be in my 2020 catch up which i, I feel like movies over the years i keep adding to that pile and i probably have to go back to 2016 and catch up but uh yeah i need to i really kind of like the the whole like making of oh you'll love movie it. movies so yeah, yeah. you'll love it yeah somehow i've i've missed it um i don't even know how that's even possible but i did so yeah i'm terrible well, apparently i guess you didn't go to fantasia then but fantastic no <laughs> it was actually at fantastic Fest, oh. and i just kept playing against other things that i had to watch to mm. cover um and sometimes you just have to make those choices and apparently i chose wrong wait so there's multiple screenings at the same time <laughs> oh there's insane. like there's like six movies at each time <laughs> it's it's crazy yeah so yeah there's just every year you just miss stuff and you just got to catch up so yeah i know it came to Again, Shudder, um, but I just I haven't had a chance to to make time for it yet. But it is up on there. There's so many movies. I still haven't seen Knife and Heart. I still, you know, there's like I, I have a whole list of things that I knew would probably have made my list this year that just didn't. But then again, I had to cut my list down from 30 to 20. So, you know, I probably didn't need more for my list. So but yeah, no, I really <laughs> want to see it. Every, everybody who came out of it was like, oh, my God, go see it. And I was like, oh, geez. So. I, I missed out. See, that's why I need to learn how to clone ourselves or just never have to sleep again. One of the two. No, then the clone goes to see it and I wouldn't have seen it. Oh, I'd true. Kill the clone. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that got dark. <laughs> you sure you're not the clone? <laughs> no, then, yeah, then my clone. I guess the original is going to kill me. Anyway, <laughs> back to you, Heather. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Derek, do you, do you have your first pick? Yes, I it, I've been trying to figure out what it is uh, during this recording, and I think I've settled on something that I can live with uh, very easily. Now everybody, now everybody knows we're not like super prepared. So thanks Damn for it. lifting the curtain on that. But I, uh, I love that unflappable uh, <laughs> endorsement there, Derek. Something I can live with. Oh yeah, not exactly a poster quote. I now that you, now that you mention it, but I really did love this movie. Uh, the movie, as I keep stalling, is Annabelle Comes Home. This was a really fun movie to see in theaters. I was really excited to see what Gary Doberman would do as a first-time director, since he's written most of the Conjuring spin-off universe and has been so involved with that world. And I think he really knocked it out of the park. Uh, they kind of have so many demonic toys to play with in this movie with the whole occult artifact room at the Warren's house. I think it's like the perfect setting. I, I think the casting is great. McKenna Grace and Madison Eisman, who have been a ton of stuff in recent years, they just continue to put in these amazing performances. And it feels like the perfect like horror sleepover movie. It, it just feels like something like I wish that this had existed like when I was a little kid so I could like watch this with friends at like sleepovers and stuff. Cause it just feels like it's, it's like scary, but it's not, it's a little more accessible, even though for some reason it has an R rating, which still kind of that boggles my mind that it has an R rating, <laughs> but, but I just loved it. So I, I had to give it some love. Is it something you would share with the cul-de-sac gang? Yes, it All is. Right. Cul-de-sac gang approved. 
Wonderful. So. Yeah, I, I really liked <laughs> Annabelle Comes Home. It, it made my honorable mentions. Um, I was pretty much excited because it has a werewolf in it. Yeah. Um, and it's like I uh, like going into it because I when I went there because uh, they had like a, a, an early screening for it. And I was talking to Gary beforehand and I was wearing my uh, werewolves, not swearwolves T-shirt. And he was like and he was like, oh, I think you're going to really like this. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? I was like, how are you? All right. And I was like, well, how do you put werewolves into like an Annabelle movie? Basically. Right. Um, and it really works well. I love the fact that we got a werewolf in a major studio horror movie this year because I don't remember the last time we got a werewolf in a major theatrical horror movie. Um, so for that alone, I'm like, yes. Um, but it's a really fun movie. It's the the cast is really fantastic. Um, it's just it, it ended up being so much better than I was expecting. Not that I was expecting it to be bad, but I really liked Annabelle Creation. And yeah. this ends up being something so different um, than that. And I just think it's it was a really fun sort of mind trip. I'll keep with the with the slight <laughs> R rating there uh, in terms of, you know, the things that these characters have to go through um, in there. And I just think there was a really great attention to detail um, that kind of went into also with the room and the different artifacts and sort of tying them into sort of the, the real cases from the Warrens, which they really apparently did have a white werewolf case. So oh if we're going to, if we're going to get a spinoff, I really want a werewolf spinoff. So I'm putting that out into the universe, make it happen. 2020. <laughs> but I think it is. And there are a lot of great creatures in it, but I think the, um, the characters in it are, are the biggest selling point um, for the movie because the, the kids are just terrific in it and their stories are given time to, you know, unfold on the screen in between all of the, um, the shenanigans. And, and that's what really stood out for me was, uh, was the kids. Yeah. And Bob. Yeah. Oh, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bob, uh, was, uh, that was, that was a great character and, and it's funny, too, because like the werewolf thing seemed I don't remember that really in the marketing of it, like with the trailer and stuff, or, unless I'm just completely forgetting something. No, like it, it, it like, wasn't at all. There's so, yeah, there's just some great secrets in it, like in a day and age where you just feel like a lot of stuff sometimes gets revealed ahead of time like this. There's just so much that they threw in this movie. And I love how every like conjuring spinoff movie. Now we get like two or three monsters that are introduced in case they want to do like more movies with them. So this one just felt like the most that we've ever gotten. And it was uh, like the feely mealy like board game that they play too. like, this is some great, like really creepy stuff in this, but it also feels fun though, too, overall. Yeah. This one was a real great one to see with a crowd. Um, I had taken my family and, and they all enjoyed it. And to, to me it was, you know, it's like a haunted attraction, um, that, um, everybody got scared. Everybody was jumping and, and everybody had a good time and you, you could tell they enjoyed it when they left the theater. Um, what I think is great too, is that for a lot of people, a lot of teens, I know this was, was R rated, but, um, you know, either, uh, older teens or if you snuck into the theater, like this is a great, like kind of summer horror movie or first summer horror movie to kind of get you into horror. Were people like jumping up in their seats and like popcorn was flying everywhere, like in the preview commercial? I, I don't know if I saw popcorn flying up like significantly high, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to recreate it one of these days for you. I don't, yeah. <laughs> very, very sensitive audiences, I guess, on, on your side of the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't see many people losing popcorn. <laughs> we're, we're so jaded in, uh, on the West Coast. We're like, oh, a movie? Okay. <laughs> so, by the way, so I went to a screening last night at the draft house, like the draft house is known for one thing, right? You don't talk, you don't text, you stay off your phone. The woman sitting next to us, the entire movie was on her phone and nobody did a thing. Uh, and I was, I was like, God, we're so in LA right now. And it was really annoying. So yeah, I that's why that I kind of... I, was I thought you got taken I, out back or something at a draft house if, if you, you did that. You should, right? And there was a security guard standing right there, and he did nothing. But, like, yeah, it was it was crazy because, like, I think that's why I like festival screenings because, for the most part, other than Sundance, like, people are pretty much on their best behavior, and everyone's there to watch the movie and have fun with it. And it's like every time you go to a movie in L.A., there's always some idiot on the phone. So, Doesn't draft yeah. house serve meals? 
Yeah. Yep. And they didn't even so, serve us dinner last night. So you, oh. they serve a, So you're not allowed to have your phone or talk, but you get to sit next to a guy who's like eating a steak, scraping the uh, plate with his knife. Yes. For, for an hour and a half. Okay. But 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 they don't serve steak. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's finger they, they, food. Yeah, I do highly recommend the pretzel though, and go all queso. Forget the uh, the the, uh, the mustard. Go all queso. Um, yeah, we spent like an hour like studying the menu. We're like, oh, we're gonna have dinner. We get in there, and they're like, oh, we're just doing popcorn and drinks tonight. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm. Oh. So yeah, disappointment all around. So you know, what are you gonna do? Um, so if they so, had steak and it was a scary movie, I could throw my steak in the air. <laughs> I knew this was going somewhere. <laughs> yes, you could toss the steak. That's exactly what you could do. No, it was so scary. People were tossing their steaks. That's there you go, right. Derek. There's your pull. There's your pull quote. Yes, I love it. Yeah, it's better so. than uh, it's better than mine that I came up with a little earlier. <laughs> I can live with this. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess uh, I should do my first pick. I suppose. If we're, if we're doing that sort of thing, um, I'm going to go with one of my biggest surprises of last year, um, which if you would have told me at the beginning of the year, this movie would have ended up on my list as a movie I even enjoyed. I would have been like, what? You're crazy. Um, but I'm going to go with the Child's Play remake. Um, mm-hmm. I am such a fan of that movie. Like I like, look. I, I am as pessimistic as, as anybody else when it comes to studio cash-ins on, you know, properties and such and things like that. Um, I was not exactly sold sight unseen um, in terms of what the doll, the new look of the doll. And I was like, OK, this is weird. Um, and then I watched it and I was like, holy crap, this is like the most fun I've had in a movie in a while. Um, I think. When you when you're doing a remake, you really want somebody to sort of take chances, um, and I think this movie takes all the right chances. Um, you know, they they kind they don't lean on the original story from Tom Holland and Dan, Don Mancini. Depending on who you ask, they'll tell you that they did the story. Um, so I don't even know who actually did it, but whatever, that's all a different thing. Um, but they don't rely on you know Charles Lee Ray as sort of the backbone. They kind of adapt it to so where do we are modern times in terms of our over-reliance on technology. Um, it's basically the movie reaffirmed the fact that I will never get an Amazon echo or any kind of that crap in my house <laughs> because I just don't need it. Um, I can use my own remote controls. Thank you very much. I don't need anybody listening to me, um, or anything like that. Um, but I just think that there was something really interesting about what the movie had to say in terms of how we interact with our technology um, how technology adapts our our society as a whole. Um, I, I think Mark Hamill as the the voice of Buddy um, slash Chucky, I guess, uh, is just it was inspired. You know, obviously he's done that kind of stuff before, but of course we always think of him as Luke Skywalker. Um, and I think he really sort of makes this performance his own in a way that no way hinders Brad Dorif as as Chucky um, and becomes its own thing. Um, I really the there's some really fun kills in this movie. I think it has a really great energy to it. Um, the score, which I'm pretty sure I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it was Bear McCreary who did it. It is Bear McCreary. Because between hit between that and Godzilla, he did some really fun scores last year. Um, is really fantastic. Um, I've been listening to it just because um, Brian's been using it for sort of inspiration for a side project he's working on, and it's it's a lot of fun. Um, just the way that he sort of utilizes toys like in the score. Um, it's so unique compared to like every score kind of just has the same heaviness to it and everything. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of really innovative sort of aspects to this movie that I was not expecting, um, and I think. Lars Kleberg really kind of kind of did a great job like and I was not expecting it I was I went in I was like all right let's do the child's play remake here we go because I love the original series I mean we're still moving along with those stories I'm still ready to see what happens after cult of Chucky um so I was kind of like all right we'll see what happens uh and it ended up just completely winning over my heart um, we ended up going and seeing it with, the, with the normies as we, you know, as I like to call it. Um, and everybody in that theater was just so 
like into it. There was people here who brought their Chucky dolls, which was like my favorite thing ever. Um, grown men with their Chucky dolls. I'm not even joking because I have pictures. Standing mm-hmm. at the popcorn stand with their Chucky dolls ready for this movie. Um, and it just really delivered in ways I was not expecting. Um, you know, and I know it's not every race cup of tea and I know everybody, you know, there's people who are very devoted to the original Child's Play franchise. So they've sort of outwardly dismissed it you know, before they've even seen it. Um, and if you're one of those folks, I would, you know, say give it a chance because I really was not expecting to have as much fun with it as I did. Uh, and I think the ending in the in the uh, department store is just so much wonderful chaos. Like, holy crap, like when there's <laughs> drones and chaos ensues and just all sorts of killer teddy bears. It's amazing. So, yeah, and the sequence um, with the gift-wrapped... Um, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a, a gift wrapped sort of <laughs> sequence that yeah. I think is honestly one of my favorite things I've seen all year in a horror movie. Um, and that's what I'll say about that. It's interesting because I was thinking about what movies I was going to pick. And obviously sometimes, you know, somebody else will pick a movie that was going to be one of my favorites. And I was looking at, I was downstairs and there was my Chucky doll that I got recently. And I was like, I, I totally forgot about Child's Play being a, a 2019 release. I missed it on my favorites, but I, it was, it, I was actually saying I would actually bring it up on the podcast. So I'm glad you did. Um, j- just echoing, uh, kind of what you said, I think one of the greatest things that this movie did was not focus on the supernatural aspects instead by leaning into the technology and essentially making, um, Chucky this, you know, this clean slate. He, he only becomes evil because he learns from people. And even though it's, it's, it's you know, he's um, picking up the wrong habits, um, it does show the dangers of AI. And it kind of uh, allows you to take the story in interesting areas for sequels. So I was really impressed with this, really surprised by this one. And uh, I'm really glad you picked it. I think the, uh, I think the trailer did the movie dirty, too. The trailer really doesn't convey what I think is the best thing about the movie, and that's the, the tone of it. It it um, it's not overly jokey, but it's it's very humorous. Um, I love the scene of the montage where they're getting to know each other. Buddy and his pal are getting to know each other. Um, it just it has this kind of lightness to it, mixed in with some really uh, great gore and. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's kind of a really unique movie. And I love that they sidestep any kind of comparisons to the original, which I know was everyone's concern going into it. So that one was a really pleasant surprise. Yeah, it's all linked to uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 as well. So that's a fun, uh, fun horror uh Poor Link. Thank there. you. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a, <laughs> it's kind of like a Leatherface <laughs> movie in a little little, little way there, but uh, yeah, it's it's way more fun than I expected, and it it almost seems like it has like the humor, a little bit of the humor of some of the later, uh, more or more recent Chucky movies, but it but then it tr- kind of packages it in, in its own thing, uh, so I like that about it, and yeah, the there's just some really twisted dark humor in it. I think Aubrey Plaza brought some good kind of comedy to it, but she had a very different character than I expected as well. And then just the whole, like the whole, like you said, Heather, the whole shopping scenes, like it feels like this goes up there with like chopping mall and night of the comet is like just a great horror movie that is like about consumerism and has a lot of things to say about AI. So yeah, it it really surprised me because I, I did not expect it to, to be as multifaceted as it was and the characters to be as compelling as they were. Like I could watch a movie uh, just with Andy's friends because there's so much there that like with the limited screen time they had, like they, they had some good characters there. So I, I really enjoyed it a lot more than, uh, than I expected. And I think a lot of people were saying that it was kind of the surprise of the summer. It was a pleasant surprise. It was definitely way better than I was expecting it to be. And and most importantly, uh, new Chucky learns to kill from watching Toby Hooper movies. <laughs> well, I literally I hadn't even left the theater yet. And I texted Patrick and I, I said, remember I, and I said, I don't know if you're going to like the new child's play or not, but I guarantee there is going to be one scene that is going to be your favorite thing ever. <laughs> and I said, just trust me on this. And I knew, and I was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my God, like that was like the best. So this is the kind of inside info you get when you're horror BFFs. Yeah. 
You, you see that one scene, yeah. you're like, oh, this is it. This is it. <laughs> so we've heard. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, Scott, you started off our discussion today by insulting everybody else. So I don't think anyone's texting you now with uh, information on movies. I don't think I did. Uh, mm, mm. I think I think that we might have the tape to prove otherwise, but that's in the out the outtakes, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into our next one. Uh, I guess Scott, we'll go back to you. Uh, what, what was your next pick for uh, best horror of twenty nineteen? This it, it this is it's stupidly hard. It really is, and I know a couple. I think that are going to come up with uh, a couple of my other peeps. So I'm going to choose. Uh, how about Midsummer? That's as good as any, I think. All right. Um, yeah. I liked Hereditary quite a bit, and I admired it a ton. Um, what I think Ari Aster improves with in Midsummer, just as a filmmaker, is there's a, a linear quality to this world that he has here that I think just plays better. Um paced better the story unfolds uh, clearer for me whether that was his intention with hereditary or not i can't say but uh his filmmaking ability with midsummer i just thought was mesmerizing um when it came out of course all the comparisons right off the top the superficial would be the wicker man but it's it's much more than that it's a movie about um, relationships and how we deal with them. And it's packaged in a basic wicker man structure, but it even takes turns away from that. And I think even at a longer length, this is one of those movies. And we had quite a few this year that were two hours, two and 20, two and a half that because they were so powerful, you don't even care about time. Um, and that's what a great movie does. And that's what Midsummer did for me. As creepy as a movie gets, it's a world that I just want to live in. Like watching it was such a interesting experience and immersive in a lot of ways, just how you're just kind of soaked in this sinister sunlight for most of the runtime. And I think the thing that I loved about the most too, is looking back on the year in horror, it's one of the, like the, the beginning and the end are just such gut punches and in very different ways that it's he really like bookended that movie uh, in in quite uh, Ari Aster fashion, which we're kind of learning uh, from his films and his in his uh, career that's just getting started uh, from the feature length side. So yeah, it, it was it was a great uh, movie just to watch with like a group of strangers in a theater and kind of looking at how they're reacting to it. I, we had such a like a, a such a diverse audience in our theater at all ages and everything. And it was just really interesting to like, see everyone kind of came to watch this movie and everyone's kind of reacting to it differently. I think some people were like laughing almost nervously or like not really knowing how to react at certain times, especially like the final 20 minutes. Uh, so it was, it, it was interesting because it almost felt like, uh, like he was playing with your expectations a little bit. And then he would just do something that you would, still shock you like it was nothing was off limits and i I guess it's not really a surprise after watching hereditary but uh, it was uh i think it was a really solid step for him as a director and i i I really want to see like even though the the original version is you know about like you said about two hours 20 minutes somewhere in there two and a half i want to see the director's cut because i really want to spend more time in that world and and see what the characters are up to. And even if it's just them eating at that giant table for another 20 minutes. (laughs) Are you, are you ready for the thunder? For the thunder? (laughs) Oh yeah. Bring it. Cause here it comes because (laughs) the, the more time I, 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 the, the more distance I get from midsummer, the less I enjoy it. Oh my. Really? That's why, that's why it did not make even my honorable mentions list. Um, so, so the thing is for me, it's an incredibly well-made movie, fantastic performances. That scene when Florence is on the couch just wailing in this sort of ungodly tone um, that I think all of us recognize um, is like pure, unadulterated pain um, is extremely powerful, yes. I feel like the movie wants to say 
this thing about her finding acceptance with this this new community and finding her power in that. And I don't think that's true because ultimately she's being manipulated by the Harga as well. Like Christian is not Christian. Um, the other gentleman, I'm totally blanking on the character's name. Um, but he's manipulating her from the get go. And her being there is they're showing her everything that she needs because she's emotionally vulnerable. Um, and I don't feel like it's necessarily as profound as it thinks it is. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I don't need hate mail, but I just, the more I've spent thinking about Midsummer and sort of embracing its different elements, the less I'm in love with it. Um, and I think for me, I think Hereditary is stronger um, in its sort of intended examination of loss and sort of the cruelness of fate um, but I just, yeah, I just, I feel, I, I feel broken inside, but I just, I, I liked it when I saw it, but I had some issues with it. Um, you just, you lose characters here and there. Like it just, I, I just, yeah, I wish I loved it more. Um, but I will say Ari Aster is easily one of the most unique storytelling voices that we have in the genre right now. I will of course be there day one for anything that he does. Um, but I think for me, I prefer Hereditary. I'm also, I'm somewhere in the middle of of, of this, but I'm still, I, I do prefer Hereditary. Um, there's something about, Hereditary is able to take familiar beats, and I feel like there's enough twists and turns where he makes it his own. Um, while having complex characters, I feel like even though the the underlying themes are, are kind of what's driving Midsummer. that the, the like story that's, that's uh, front facing is, is, you know, you kind of know where it's going the whole way. So it, to me, it's, it's, it's less surprising. It looks beautiful. Um, but I feel like I know where it's going the entire way. Um, I think technically speaking, I think Midsummer may be a, a more well-made movie, um, or at least I, I think it's more interesting what he was able to do in, in broad daylight and how ter terrifying he was able to make it. Um, but personally, I enjoy watching Hereditary uh, much better. That being said, I do want to see the director's cut and see maybe if there's something that I missed. See if there's that Hereditary Midsummer crossover, maybe. I don't think so. I think I would have heard about that. Mm. <laughs> like Paymon mm. hooks up with the bear or something like that, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, also, like, I know this is such a nitpick, and I get that you don't do this because, like, you can't see people's eyes for, you know, performances or whatever, but I don't want to hear that because people do performances, you know, behind makeup and masks and all that kind of stuff and helmets and things. Like, you're telling me in blinding sunlight, not a single person coming there to visit wears sunglasses? Like, my eyes hurt in the theater from watching that movie. And these kids are, like, in this blinding sunlight. I get it. Like, oh, you need the eyes for the performances. Like, but I feel like a lot of those performances would come through. But I was just, like, halfway through this movie, I'm like, these idiots are going to, like, end up scorching their corneas because they're not wearing sunglasses. So, yeah, I, I nitpick on stupid details like that. So <laughs> honestly, like. But you did have I the one guy who vaped. So that made up for the sunglasses. <laughs> in terms of looking cool, right? Did, you know. did it, though? <laughs> there may have been the removed scene where they collected the sunglasses. That might be in the, the director's cut. Yeah, they're like, no phones, no sunglasses. <laughs> like a security yeah. gate. We, they, they left out the security <laughs> gate scene. But, yeah. the, but the vape got through. The vape got through, yeah. If it was in a clear bag, right, it could get through. <laughs> <laughs> I think the... I think the lack of surprises, as you were saying, Jonathan, I for me, that felt that only added to it in the sense that you know what's coming. So there's just a sense of dread as to when and exactly how it's going to unfold. But I think that inevitability of it is is part of its appeal for me. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Well, now that yeah. I, I, I tinkled all over Scott's parade, I'm sorry, Scott. No, I it's didn't fine. Mean to. No, it's good. I didn't mean to. Well, I also, also, I hope that, um, I hope that our like medical, Medicare, you know, medical uh, situation, the, you know, as we get older, I hope we don't have to re resort to the midsummer tactic uh, for like, you know, retirement or. <laughs> 
as we oh, uh, like an AARP alternative plan. I just I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> well, I'm already uh, my birthday's in March. I'm doing it. Oh, oh okay. I, I just have to make sure if I do the jump. Oh, yeah. Let's let's talk about that for a minute. If I do yeah. the jump, I'm not going to screw it up and like just break my leg. No, I'm I'm going to make sure I practice or that yeah. I that I that, that I hit it right. Well, I'm also <laughs> going to make sure uh, before I do it that everybody's wearing sunglasses. <laughs> and Thank vaping. you. And vaping. Thank uh, you. Well, I'm going to be, be fifty. I'm going to be fifty next week, so I'm I'm going to ask that they reinstate carousel. Um, Renew. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I want, that's how I want to go. I'm not jumping off a cliff. I'll just end I, up brick twisting my ankle or something. I like carousel. You get the mask. You get to float yes. for a little bit. Yeah. You think you're going to be reborn? <laughs> I literally have no idea what you're talking about right now. Logan's run. run. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. No, I don't. Of course, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a jerk. It's funny because I just watched that movie like literally a month ago, and it, I also it took me a while to figure out what was going on there. <laughs> His references are very old, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sandman. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, with that, I guess we'll jump into Patrick's next pick, uh, which probably won't be Scream Queens. So. <laughs> oh, no, again, I'm going to try to shine a light on an independent film, uh, the second film that came out this year from the same filmmaker, and that is Satanic Panic, uh, directed by Chelsea Stardust, whose first movie, All That We Destroy, was released in May as part of Hulu's Into the Dark series and was my favorite. I, I didn't see all the Into the Darks, but of the ones that I saw, All That We Destroy was my favorite. Satanic Panic is a very different film. Um, Satanic Panic plays like uh, the fever dream of a young girl who loves horror, who who wants to put all this stuff into a movie and finally gets the chance. And so it's part Evil Dead and part Jennifer's Body. And uh, it's like a really fun kind of sleepover movie. There's practical gore. There's body horror. There's monsters. There's uh, a satanic cult. There's pizza. There's everything you could really want in a horror comedy. Um, it's probably my favorite horror comedy of the year. I can't think of another one that I enjoyed more. Um, and I was lucky enough to see it at a festival and it played really, really well with the crowd. But I've watched it at home, too, and it plays just as well. It's worth seeing just for the five minutes that Jerry O'Connell is in the film because it's one of the funniest scenes in a movie this mm. year. Um and it's what it's available on VOD now for anybody who's interested. My guess is it'll land on Shutter sometime this year, but don't wait. Rent it now. Or buy it. Or buy it. And and if you buy it at is it Walmart, you can get it just as panic. Insert your own adjective, damn it. That's right. <laughs> Take out the panic out of your satanic uh, <laughs> or your satanic out of your panic. Um, yeah, I was a, I really enjoyed satanic panic a lot. Um, I mean, it's it's basically like a gift to horror fans. It, like the, the cast top to bottom is really fun. Um, you mentioned Jerry O'Connell, who, of course, you know, I absolutely adore. Uh, I think Rebecca Romaine is fantastic. But I think even like the supporting roles end up sort of being really fun. Um, I loved Ruby Modine in this also, um, who is, you know, of course, from the Happy Death Day movies. Um, and I, I loved seeing like Jeff Daniel Phillips in there. And one of my you know favorites, A.J. Bowen, pops up in there. Clark Wolf is in there at a certain point who's become a friend. Um, you know, Jordan so Ladd me, shows up. Yes, Jordan Ladd as well. Um, mm. It's just it's it, it has such a really fun energy to it. And I think Haley, um, who's a lead like she it, it would have been so easy to kind of lose her character in a movie filled with sort of like bigger than life performances. And she's so good and so likable. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really want to root for her. And I love how her I love her character arc in it as well. Um, I think it's 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 got something really good to say uh, about female like sort of women's places in this world and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just sort of being young in this world and trying to figure your shit out. Um, but, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with that one. I was kind of bummed you got to do the review for it, but you did a very good review. So I will I will concede. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, I, I saw this at Popcorn Frights as well, and it was 
probably one of the biggest crowd pleasers there. And seeing that Grady Hendrix wrote the screenplay uh, is is pretty fitting because I know he's he's done a lot of like horror comedy novels and things like that. So I think he really brought that sensibility to this movie. And it almost feels like a Fear Street book that just like goes completely off the rails, like like a really hard R Fear Street or something like that. So I think it embraces it kind of embraces like that sleepover movie mentality, but then just goes even a little bit further with everything and has uh, they have a lot of fun with it. So, yeah, it's it truly is uh, an unpredictable movie because just when you actually I, I don't even think there was a point where I thought I knew where it was going. So <laughs> that uh, that's always a fun ride. Um, so do we want to jump into your next pick, Derek? Ooh. I suppose I uh, I do have to come up with a second. No, I do have this one prepared. Uh, I'm going to, I guess I'll take it back to the studio system with, with my second pick and I'll stay on brand by doing another, I, well, I guess uh, kind of a YA uh, aimed movie, if you, if you could call it that. And that is uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, this was kind of along the lines of Ambo comes home, just a really fun but also frightening horror movie uh really fun to watch with an audience can't it's kind of amazing that like this one is pg-13 but ammo comes home as r because this one actually got under my skin a lot more uh just with the whole creature design and the i know they had like javier botet was in this and twisty troy james uh so some really talented creature performers bringing these nightmares to life and Andre Overdahl, I thought was just really did a great job, uh, bringing, uh, a, a very daunting task of bringing these books, uh, to life, like these beloved books that people have read for generations and are so notorious for like being banned from libraries. And, and so everyone kind of knows those, uh, you know, bringing Stephen Gamel's artwork to life and then Alvin Schwartz's, taken all these really uh old stories it's it's not an easy task to do but i think he really lived up to the task and i know like it didn't seem like everyone maybe fell in love with it as much as maybe they were hoping but i think they did a really admirable job and uh, i just thought it was a really fun ride and it's also kind of fun to have a movie set like in the late 60s because uh it's you know you don't always see that it, uh, nowadays as much. So I think it was, it was very fun, nostalgic trip, but it was also very scary at the same time. And I'm never walking through a cornfield again. <laughs> and I, I did choose yeah, it I because a goosebumps movie didn't come out this year. So this is the next closest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I actually somehow missed this. Um, I think it was cause I was traveling in August. So, and basically <laughs> if I don't get to see it opening weekend, it just kind of passes me, uh, right over. Um, so I was a little bummed about that, but one of these days I'll get to catch up with it. Um, but I really, I was a big fan of the creature designs that I saw from spectral motion. Um, cause I think they did a really good job. Um, especially with the pale lady. Cause oh, that gosh, is a yeah. really, that's a really hard character to pull off practically. Um, and I think they did a really great job with that. Um, but yeah, I didn't see it. So I literally can talk about the effects, but that's, that is it. It's a big part of the movie. And a lot of it, more of it was practical too, right? Because like, I know there's some discussion about like the CG versus practical, but I think a lot of it was practical. Yeah, it totally was. Nice. I did see it and I will keep my thoughts to myself. <laughs> so, so you're not going to be like me and, and just <laughs> tinkle all over Derek's parade? Well, I, I also for did the life have a, me, I can't you, figure out why yeah. they didn't just do it as an anthology, but that's just one of my issues. It's it's the Jumanji uh, approach. You know, you yeah. just got to you got to bring it all into one big old melting pot of a movie. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do wish that, that they take that they take more chances and do more anthologies. I, I know they think they're not bankable, but come on. Um, anyway, I, I did enjoy scary stories, um, just because it, it, it kind of allowed me to kind of revisit the books and, and relive, you know, all those great memories of seeing that. And then to see them moving and on the big screen, um, I, I, I do have problems with the film. Um, but I also really had a, a fun time seeing it and going with my family and watching them enjoy it. And I also think the worst case, um, you know, we have uh, a whole new generation of kids that um, have seen the movie and are like, hey, let me pick up these books and get introduced to that. So um, I think that's cool. I do think that's cool as well. 
Um, I guess that kind of brings us up to your next pick, Jonathan. Oh, if this I'm, one's so if I'm tough. I'm paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tough because we're 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 running down on on our picks, and like Patrick was like, I'm not going to pick this because I think somebody else will, but I don't know the, the pressure. Um, I, I'm mm-hmm. going to kind of along the lines of of what Patrick said. Um, I'm going to pick uh, what what a lot of people, a, a lot of um, you know people on on Twitter probably know about because there's been a lot of buzz about it, but maybe some of our uh, younger listeners or more casual horror fans may not be aware of um so i'm gonna throw that one out there and that's bliss bliss was one of my favorite movies of 2019 uh it's no surprise because i love vampire movies but kind of like zombie movies as i mentioned there's just a lot of vampire movies that are okay and uh i think that this one really surprised me and also i was really impressed with with joe bagos because you know, he he first uh, came out with Almost Human uh, years back, and and the the movie was was fine. I enjoyed it, but this is on a completely different level. Um, and uh, I, I think obviously it, it really helps. This was a uh, 16 millimeter, kind of like I was saying for for Lose. It kind of gives it that feeling of like a movie that you missed, or that especially that came out in the 80s. Um, this is this definitely has that near dark vibe. It's gritty. I I like the uh, like the the starving artist story that this follows. There's just uh, I don't want to give too much away because I know not many people have seen it, but I just think that this is, you know, one like, you know, drug fueled vampire trip uh, that I really dug with with an awesome soundtrack. Yeah, it, it really feels like going down a rabbit hole. It, it feels like you're almost you're almost uh, on a drug yourself while watching it just because the it's so in your face and the music is relentless and the it's it, the the grindhouse kind of aesthetic of it just they just double down on that so much and it it, it's you're right it's like every time you think that you maybe have seen it all in a subgenre someone comes along and and takes a different approach to it and i think it works not only because joe bagos but also dora madison is so committed in that role as desi that you feel like she's a real person that all these things are happening and she does some things that are not maybe the greatest thing for a person to do, but so you almost feel conflicted, like rooting for her at times, but you're just along for the ride and you just hold on and, and see where you end up by the end of the bloodbath. And it is so much fun to watch, especially like super late at night. I think it's the perfect midnight movie. And I, it's one that I definitely want to revisit in the future. And it's, it's uh, yeah, like I said, it's great. It's got that 16 millimeter vibe to it. So it, everything just kind of works perfectly with this movie, I think. Uh, it was shot on 16 millimeter. Well, even better. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, yes, just not a vibe. It was on. <laughs> yes, it was actually shot on 16 millimeter. Yes. Um, yeah, wow. I, I had a lot of fun with it. I think um, for me in sort of the the pantheon of, of Joe Bigos movies, um, I think VFW is, is, is my favorite, um, which doesn't technically count because it comes out here in March. I think we're finally getting it. Or is it- um, valentine's day i can't remember i don't know i feel like it might be march um, i think it's i think it's valentine's day oh Not that's right hbfa um okay <laughs> fine Perfect it's valentine's movie. day no what it's what you said Heather. it's what you said <laughs> yeah that's right um, it's march <laughs> i don't know it's I, I don't know anything past january um when i get to when i get to whatever month it comes out then i'll know for sure um, that's, that's how I live my life. One, one VOD release month at a time. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked bliss. Um, I, I, I felt like it was missing a little bit of a, of a, of a soul to it, but I do think, um, there are some really fantastic elements to it. Um, especially, you know, the fact that it was all practical there, cause there's just no way to do visual effects on that kind of, on that kind of project. Um, which was done by Josh and Sierra Russell, um, who's done a lot of sort of really fun stuff on the indie level of horror movies. Um, I think they do some pretty gnarly stuff. Poor um, J- Jeremy Gardner in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite pastime now is just watching poor Jeremy Gardner uh, bite it in horror movies. Um, but he's uh, he's a trooper. I, he's the fun, the great thing about him is he's such a great director, but he's a really fun actor too. And I'm sort of torn as to which way I want his career to continue to go. So I hope it can, he can keep up with doing both um, because he's super fun to watch. Uh, which is also my way of saying you guys should see After Midnight when that comes out. 
whenever that is, March, February, Juneteenth, I don't know at this point. Um, but I know that one is coming out in a few months. Um, and he's really, he's great in it. He directed a really great movie and it's got some fun stuff in it. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think bliss is right up there with, with Joe's movies, but I'm, I'm VFW, man, that movie just rocked my balls off. If I, if I could be crude, that movie was just everything I wanted and that, and everything I didn't know I wanted. Um, so I think for me, that just kind of, it reigns supreme. So I can't wait for VFW, and uh, I know Bliss is going to be on Shutter in the next month, possibly this month. But uh, people should check it out if, if only for the last twenty minutes. Yes, I guess we're. Con- I guess it, is it my turn now? We're back to you. Oh wow! So like nobody's mentioned like other movies where I'm like, do, like there's like ten I, movies. Like that's a problem uh, I had. So that like, do tough. I mention the movies that like? I feel like should like should be. I mean, but there's so many movies that we've like talked about ad nauseum. Um, so I don't know. Like, <sighs> maybe you can do like a, a Frankenstein pick where you just put four yeah, movies so my, together. Yeah. So my my last pick would be um, it's it's a real it's a real crowd pleaser. Uh, Ready or not, crawl, Doctor Sleep <laughs> Us, um, Knives Out, Little Monsters. <laughs> Tigers are not afraid. Uh, yeah, I don't even know. Um, I should just be a jerk and just pick uh, Escape Room just to really mess with all of you because I love Escape Room. <laughs> I love Escape Room, too. <laughs> we, we, we liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. I'm torn between. OK, I, I, mean, I feel like it should be us because us is a fantastic movie. But like my heart is like, well, Crawl was like a really another big surprise. Yeah. And also then my then my heart is like, but I really feel like I need more people to advocate for Happy Death Day to you because all yes. you jerks out there who were so mad that it wasn't slashery enough for you. You're <laughs> the reason we're not getting a third one. And I'm mad at you guys for that. Um, I guess I'll go crawl. I'll go crawl um, because Alexandra Aja is an incredibly interesting director to me because he's, you know, obviously he came up sort of with high tension in the hills uh, have eyes remake. Um, which I think, you know, I, I still have really big issues with high tension. Um, I think a lot of people do, but I, there's no mistaking a talented director when you see one. And I think there's some really sort of good calling cards for him as a filmmaker there, um, which I think sort of he parlayed into the Hills Have Eyes remake, uh, which I think is pretty fantastic. And I actually prefer to the original. I'm sorry, um, but I do. And it's interesting because then he sort of had this weird sort of lull. I don't want to say lull, but he wasn't hitting horror as hard uh, for a while, which I think is why it, I think he's kind of interesting. Because if you're somebody like Aja who's made films like High Tension and Hills Have Eyes remake, like it seems, you know, like, oh, you know, this is a guy who's going to just keep making hard movies. Um, Piranha 3D being another one of those movies. Um and then he goes and he does Horns, um, which is sort of this weird, dreamy Joe Hill story, um, which I think is better than a lot of people sort of gave it credit for. It's messy. It's definitely messy. Um, but it's it's got a lot of good stuff to it. Um, and then there was also The Ninth Life of Louis Drax, which I didn't love. Um, so I was kind of like, OK, let's let's see him come back into the fold. And I think with Crawl, he does that triumphantly. Um, that movie is just gangbusters all around let's let's throw every actiony cliche we can at this movie because it deserves it and more um you know it's it's got a really good story at the heart of it between a daughter and a father you know who has sort of become separated be you know due to the fact that there's like this division in their family um and they both have to sort of fight for each other to kind of come through this craziness of of a hurricane and you know alligators um which just seems like on paper we'd be watching a sci-fi movie and yet it is never a sci-fi movie no offense to sci-fi movies um but it takes its premise very seriously and the stakes are very real um not to say that it's not fun watching trashy floridians getting eaten by alligators once they're looting because you know you get what you deserve um but it has the good sense to like just not 
do what you're expecting. And I do think it has probably the two best jump scares of the year in it. And it's a really good blend of visual effects and practical effects uh, with the Gators. And I just think, like, I want to see a hundred movies like this from from Aja. Like, for me, I just, it was such a, a breath of fresh air this summer. Um, it was so damn satisfying. Again, I went and saw it again in theaters after, you know, I covered it. Uh, and people were clapping during it. And I just love when you can really sort of ingrain a film into a, an act of participation sort of response from an audience. Um, and I just think for me, like, I, I was expecting to have fun with it. I just wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did. Um, and I'm really glad that, like, you know, Sam Raimi basically just let Aja go out there and just do what he was going to do. If, yeah. uh, if this came out in the 60s, uh, William Castle would have put it out and he would have handed out an alligator to every person who came into the theater. It's or just he would have had a, him, like, crawl yeah. under the seats or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just such a great, simple, high-concept construct, but within it, it manages to to have lots of good character moments as well. But at its core, you know, it's, it's, it's B movie, high concept heaven alligators in a house. Let's go. It is a blast. And if I had been eating popcorn while watching this, I would have thrown it all over the place. Cause I, I agree. It had probably the best jump scares that I saw all year. And I also didn't expect it to turn into like that movie bait where it's in a convenience store. And because like you said, there's this like, interesting side story that I did not know would happen with the uh, stuff that's going on across the street that I really enjoyed and had some like dark humor to it, but it's, it's such a ride and it's, it's interesting because you mentioned like the Hills have eyes, I guess like watching the Blu-ray special features. And I, I, I talked to Alexandra as well about this, but they, I guess when he did hot tension, they um, Sam Raimi wanted him to do a movie that he was going to produce. I think it was like the messengers. And so, but then the, the Hills have eyes came up. So he had an opportunity to work with Craven or Raimi and he chose Craven at the time, but then he always wanted to work with Raimi still. So this is like a kind of a full circle experience for him, but it, it was, it was great to see him like really go back to like hardcore horror because this was a very, uh, very diehard, uh, intense horror movie uh, way more intense than I expected and had some surprises that I also didn't see coming. So I, I'm glad you mentioned it because I think it got a little, maybe a little overlooked just because there was so much that came out this summer. And sometimes people are like running, you know, they're out of town or whatever, and maybe they miss movies, but I think it's definitely worth watching if you haven't, or if you missed it with all the horror goodness that came out this summer. Yeah, I would say we definitely got uh, spoiled this summer. <laughs> I mean, this year overall. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, especially when we talk about 10 different horror movies, and there's probably another 30 that we could talk about. So I guess maybe... I we'll know, I feel bad. Yeah, you should. <laughs> you should feel really terrible about this. So I hope you all can sleep at night. Um, but maybe before we wrap up, if you guys want to give like two honorable mentions before we, we, we sign off for this episode. Uh, Scott, we'll start with you real quick. Why'd you say real quick? Hold on. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you kidding me? You can't think of two other movies? Hold on. I have a whole list. You know me. Do, I have do, lists. Do you need to get your walker to go get that list? Uh, like, okay, <laughs> fine. You know what's great? Say, okay, I'll, okay. Tell this, me what's great, Scott. Tell I'm us. I'm going to tell you. You listen up <laughs> right am, now. What is I great? Am. I really liked Ma. I know a lot of people didn't. But to me, it's the kind of movie that... Joan Crawford or Betty Davis would have made in, you know, that hag exploitation phase. I hate that phrase, but it is what it is. Um, except Octo Octavia Spencer, of course, is is not in the position that they were in her career. Hers is in full bloom and thriving. But it's that kind of role, and she she attacks it with that same kind of uh, relish that that those two ladies would have. And I just, I think it's a kick. And I think it's probably one of my favorite performances um, of the year. Don't make me drink alone. Um, which mm -hmm. by the way, I still have my, <laughs> I still have my mailer that she sent that they sent me. And so every once in a while I open it up and I, Octavia Spencer is, does a little video for me telling me to not, to don't make her drink alone. Mm -hmm. um, and we also got Luke. <laughs> I, I know nobody else is going to mention it. 
but we also got Luke Evans's penis. So there you go. There's always that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So someone's got to talk about it. And I know none yeah. of you guys are going to do it. So there you go. And I uh, did, you beat me to it. I, I did confirm with the director that yes. And that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> and uh, Luke Evans's penis is also playing Coachella on day two. I think I will be there. <laughs> I'll, I'll go both weekends. I'm fine. I like their early stuff. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, I get that. <laughs> on, on Rough Trade, yeah. Their stuff on Rough Trade was great. <laughs> You're a true <laughs> fan. Oh, boy. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to, to step all over your first choice. What's your, what's your second one, Scott? Oh, you want two, do you? I, I That's 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 number I threw out there. Uh, fine, okay. Uh, no one has talked about horror noir yet, which I... I know it's all up there for for all of us. Um, what a movie! A movie way past uh, you know it's it's due date to for us to address uh, black people in horror and their contributions and um, where it originated. And it's a fascinating documentary, which again is on Shutter. Um, for anyone who wants to know more about uh, black history in horror films it's a fascinating documentary it's also very very entertaining it's very funny um it's just a terrific look at a neglected uh section of the horror world and um yeah like i said it's it's way overdue but i think it's essential viewing for anyone who's serious about learning about horror Derek, what are you, or actually, we'll go to Patrick because that was the that was the way we were going, and I don't want to disrupt the flow. Patrick, what are your two honorable mentions? Um, uh, first, I'll mention uh, Doctor Sleep, which I did not bring up because I was sure Jonathan was going to talk about it. So I almost did. I, I know. I was so torn. Oh. It's okay because you got to talk about a different, another movie that people should see. You know, uh, so it's nice to kind of be able to shine a light on something like Bliss, Doctor Sleep. You know, a studio movie that didn't quite catch on with the general public but for me it's the it's the best horror movie of the year um and uh, the other one i'll mention is the furies which is a film that's streaming now on shutter yeah uh and i went into it knowing absolutely nothing i knew the title and so i think i watch. had i think i made it you watch it for to review it right yeah that was, you did. That was an it, assignment I, and look at that I knew a title and nothing more. And so to watch it unfold and to kind of slowly figure out what's going on in that movie was really, really fun. Um, we didn't get a ton of good slasher movies this year. And so for me, the Furies is the best and it's sort of a movie about being a slasher movie in its own way. Uh, but it's really, really fun. It's an Australian film. And like I said, it's streaming now on Shutter. And the best shave of the year. Holy shit. <laughs> I need to watch this now. Add oh, it to yes. the pile. All right. Uh, Derek, how about for you? Well, uh, I'm going to kind of piggyback on one you mentioned with your Frankenstein uh, pick there, and that is Happy Death Day to You. It's the only movie I saw in theaters twice uh, last year and was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I think this uh, there's horror in it. There's sci-fi, there's comedy. It's like a back to the future horror movie. I, th I think you had mentioned that too, Heather. Like it just was the perfect follow-up to everything that Christopher Landon established in the, in that world and everything that Jessica Roth did in that first movie. I think it just was such a natural progression. And then they took you to unexpected places and, just had a blast with it. And I like the, the death montage I thought was even better the second time around with uh, hard times by pair by a Paramore plane. Uh, I just loved it. So I, I also wish we could get that third one. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get like an animated uh, movie or something. I don't know if we do a Kickstarter, we can get something who knows, but uh, yeah, that was just so much fun. I love the, the corpse Skull episode you did on that getting all those behind the scenes goodies on the making of the movie. So that was a lot of fun. That's definitely one I had to mention and give a shout out to. Oh, and surprisingly also music by Bear McCreary. Is there anything he did not do this year? <laughs> I mean, come on. The so it is a legend in the making. Indeed. Uh, and for my second pick, one that really surprised me, it was kind of like a, 
straight to DVD, very limited release, but it's called The Black String and stars Frankie Muniz. And no, this is not just because I'm trying to pick something linked to the early 2000s. Mm. I mean, it happens to be that. But uh, the reason I'm picking it, though, is because it's really uh, a, a great performance by Muniz as this guy who like calls a singles line and ends up getting basically ends up contracting this disease. And you, the whole movie is so ambiguous that you don't know if if it's all in his mind or if this like secret cult is really after him and that there's this demon that's going after him. It's it's so it's like Jacob's Ladder meets It Follows, I think is the best way to describe it. Uh, it's it's a super strong story and it's it's a really uh, pretty, pretty uh, relentless performance by Munez, who I hadn't seen uh, in, in a while. So it was great to see him kind of take on this role and and dip his or kind of dive head first in the horror pool. And I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for uh, if you like your horror ambiguous, it's uh, it's definitely a good pick. So I, I want to give a shout out to that one as well. Is it better than Big Fat Liar? Hey. Uh, I would say so. I mean, it doesn't have like the the fun pool die gig in it, but uh, I, you know, you'll have some fun with it. It's no, co- <laughs> it's no Agent Cody Banks though. Actually, what's no, it's did not. You, no. <laughs> did you guys did you guys talk? With, did you interview Frankie Muniz or did you inter- interview the director? I, I I did interview Frankie Muniz. Yes. Did you uh, did you talk about like his memory issues? Um, I didn't ask him straight up about it, but he did kind of like talk about. About like I, I kind of asked him about like Dancing with the Stars and how he kind of like was getting back into the public eye and everything around that time. So we didn't go like super deep into it, but yeah, he did kind of like touch on that a little bit. And he actually like he uh, his his fiance uh, and him run like an olive oil company together. So he's like he's like yeah, on Sundays I just like watch football and and I put together like olive oil bottles in the in the living room. And so he was like <laughs> he's definitely got like an interesting life. But yeah, I know the 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 memory loss stuff was pretty shocking to to learn about that. Yeah, because he had to step away for a while because of it, which is kind of crazy because uh, I used to watch Malcolm in the Middle a lot uh, and the kids I used to babysit for, which I don't know if they're probably around your age, Derek, but they used to watch <laughs> Agent Cody Banks like so yes. much. Oh, so I was just like, you know, so I, I was it was crazy because I didn't realize like what sort of made him have to step away. And then I read an article like a few years ago about that. And I was like, wow, that's kind of bananas that that kid went through so much. Um, but it's it's good to see him come back. Uh, but I can call anybody who's like at least 10 years younger than me a kid. So even though he's, you know, not little Frankie Muniz anymore, he's grown up Frankie Muniz, but he's still a kid to me. So. But yeah, what a what a fascinating story. So good for him that he's found some he's found his way back, but he's also doing stuff he still wants to do. So And and fingers crossed for Agent Cody Banks three at some point. I mean, if we can get a new Lizzie McGuire series, then why not bring that back too? Yes. Uh fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh Jonathan, how about your two honorable mentions? Okay. Uh I'll start with Girl on the Third Floor. Um, I think that was oh, one with of my, my favorite. With, with my with my my best friend Sam Punk. Oh, of course, yeah, with your best friend. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and if you, if you haven't listened to uh, Heather's Corpse Club <laughs> episode with Sam Punk, make sure to check it out. Um, but yeah, this was this was a, a good one for me. I mean, I as a producer, um, tr- I love <laughs> Travis Stevens movies as a producer. You're getting but, so choked um, up over it. That's how much I you did. Love it. I got so <laughs> choked up. Yeah, that uh, you know, y- y- you never know how they'll, how they'll they'll handle the transition. Um, but I think he handled it very smartly. Um, I, it's a self-contained film and that it takes place all in a house, but it's it's weird. It's goopy. It's I, I, like I said before, and other people have said it. It feels a little hellraisery, um, but I think uh, it also does a great job of dealing with timely themes um, such as toxic masculinity, and it hinges on the the performance of uh, CM Punk, who absolutely knocks it out of the park. Um, I hope we see a lot more from him. Um, I you know this just hit. I think it just hit Blu-ray and DVD recently. Recently, I know it's on VOD, um, but yeah, make sure to check this one out. Can I, can I also just point out that this is another movie about toxic masculinity directed by a, a dude, yet somehow not an issue in the public. It's just weird to me. So weird. Anyway, I digress. Mm-hmm. I just think it's interesting. I just think it's interesting that certain movies by female directors 
have a lot more discussion about them than ones from male directors. I find it very fascinating, which is yeah, nothing I, against I, you guys. No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, you, you, you do not see, we didn't see horror bros going after Travis Stevens. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I do want to say it's one of the things is we're bringing up so many movies. I feel like some of the ones that we mentioned, you know, are especially with girl on the third floor, it feels like that one's kind of gone under the radar. Um, but yeah, I hope more people check it out. Um, and then my next one is again, I'm, I'm torn. I'm going to say the lighthouse, (laughs) the lighthouse might not have been one of my, my favorite films. Um, and I don't know if I'll rewatch it, but it was, it was, it was a great experience. It, and, and and I think I, I'm just surprised that a movie like that was in theaters and I was sitting with a full audience and I'm like, how did, how did they get this on screens across the, uh, uh across the country? It feels like a movie, um, that, that was, you know, recovered that, that was shot in the 1920s. Um, the performances are great. Um, I understand why people don't like it. It's, it's drawn out. Um, th- there's not much of a payoff. Um, even if you, you like the witch, I understand how this, this could strain your patience. Uh, b- but I enjoyed it. And, and like I said, I think it, it, the, the fact that it's out in theaters, the story behind how it was made is probably more fascinating than the film, but still it's something that has stuck in my head. Almost kind of like the Lords of Salem when I saw that. I didn't love it when I saw it, but I just couldn't get it out of my head. This is one of those movies. Uh, Lighthouse is definitely a movie I don't know that I'll ever watch again. Um, I, I guess I'm glad I saw it. Um, but I think The Witch for me is still the Robert Eggers go-to movie because uh, that one I still kind of feel in my soul. This one I was just – I appreciated it like like art in a museum, but I don't think it really hit me as hard as I was hoping. I was really jazzed for it, so I was a little bummed. But, you know, if you, if you want to watch Daniel Radcliffe – do weird things and that's what I'll leave at that. Uh, it's, it's something. So yeah, it's got good, great performances though, but I think everybody, you mean Robert like, Pattinson, you said, you said Daniel Radcliffe. Holy shit. You know, what's really Wait. funny during fantastic fest. I did the same thing. We can leave that in. I don't even care. Um, that mm-hmm. was a running joke because like halfway through the movie, I was like, God, Daniel, Rad- like this is uh, all these, you know, young white boys just look the same to me now. Um, like for real, I was like, I spent half the movie going, wow, Daniel Radcliffe is like so transformative in this movie. So that became a <laughs> joke. I'm totally fine with leaving it. We do not have to edit it. I don't care. Yes. Um, no, because we- the, the, literally we're just, we have like the same five white boys that play like, you know, these, these roles. Um, you know, open it up some more. If somebody recommends Timothy Chalamet for like every movie, like I just immediately tune them out. I'm like, yes, I get it. He's great. We have other actors out there, but yes, that was like the joke where everyone's like, where I would come out of a movie and they'd be like, so how was Daniel Radcliffe? I was, <laughs> he was excellent. He was so good. And Dolomite is my name. Like, I can't even tell you. Um, yeah, no, that was a joke. So we could totally leave that and we don't have to edit that. Cause I don't care. <laughs> He doesn't voice the seagull, right? He's no, he's really not he in does. it. Maybe he does. Maybe he does. We don't even know. Um, but I will say Daniel Radcliffe is a delight on, um, oh my goodness, it's on TBS. Oh yeah, um, Miracles, um, Miracle Workers. Miracle Workers, yes. And I'm really excited about the new season that's all medieval. Um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. But yes, no, I don't mean to dismiss the 20-something uh, white male actors out there. But, you know, we get the same five ones for, like, everything. So, But I will say I'm, it's fun to see Robert Pattinson doing some weird shit this year between this and High Life. Like, go wild. You know, I'll, I'll watch him do whatever, um, including some of the things that he does in this movie. Yeah, I still need to see The Lighthouse, but I saw someone on, when the trailer came out, someone on YouTube did, like, uh, they put together sp- spongebob footage with like mr krabs going crazy and it fit perfectly so i don't know if, i don't know if that's if, if, that if mr <laughs> if mr krabs had been in the lighthouse this might have been my favorite movie of the year i was gonna say it might have helped <laughs> <laughs> oh all right um was that your second pick i can't even remember what number are we yeah, on what day it was, is it no, I- yeah, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay. I Oh, that's right. You did Girl on the Third Floor. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I, I feel like saying us is obvious. There's there's a lot of ones that are kind of obvious. Um, I think my one first movie that I would advocate for is Tigers Are Not Afraid. Yeah. Um, a movie that really struck me uh, deeply. Um, it's just powerful um, filmmaking that I, I know there's been so many times that it's been compared to, compared to Del Toro's stuff. Um, especially Devil's Backbone, which I get because I'm guilty of doing the same thing. Um, I just recently rewatched it 
Um, and it's so confidently its own thing. And Issa Lopez is probably one of the most exciting filmmakers out there. Is she doing a werewolf movie? Is that, am I, am I totally making that up? I do remember. And I think Del Toro is producing like it. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So whatever year that comes out, that'll definitely be like my favorite movie of the year. It already is. So if it's 2021, that's I'm ready. Um, but I think she's just such a special, unique storyteller. Um, I will absolutely see everything that she does from here on out. Um, and to work with the different elements that she had to work with in this movie and do it so confidently and the visual, you know, things that like it shouldn't work as well as it does um, in terms of sort of the fantasy elements. Uh, she does a really excellent job with it. Um, so I that's my first one. And then I think my second one, I'm going to go with Little Monsters. Um, which is a movie that it's like my go-to recommendation for people who don't really like horror movies that much. Um, because I feel like despite all of its goriness and freakouts and craziness, um, there's a really good heart to this movie um, that I just really loved. Um, I saw it at Sundance last year. And I'll tell you, like, when you're walking out of screenings at like 2 a.m. in the morning, everyone's just like trying to get out the door as fast as they can. They're tired. You want to get in the shuttle. You want to go to sleep because you got to be up and doing this crap. But you're like in six in six hours. Uh, and that is the first time I've ever walked out of a screening at like 2.30 in the morning where people are singing along to the end credits. Like everybody was singing Mbop, which is just like ridiculous. Like I've never experienced that. And in a year where Lupita Nyong'o like just completely floors us with us. Uh, Along Comes Little Monsters, which is so different than her roles in Us. And I think she is, like, I don't understand why it took so ho Hollywood so damn long to catch on the fact that she is a leading lady. Like, she has an Oscar. And how long does it take him for her to be accepted again as a leading lady? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, and I think she more than proves it, you know, obviously in Us, and but also in Little Monsters. Uh, I think she's really great in it. It's got some, you know, really fun moments. Tiny Darth Vader is like one of the best things of the year. Um, it just, it warmed my heart, my cold, dead heart uh, in ways I wasn't expecting. And as I mentioned, and I apologize, Mr. Gad, if you're listening, it actually made me not hate Josh Gad. And I'll tell you what, that is no easy feat, my friends, um, because there there's certain actors where I just see and I'm like, oh, God. Um, and he, <laughs> I don't know why, but he's one of them. And I apologize it's Paul Reiser all over again. Um, and I just, he, even he, I enjoyed in this movie. So that says something. Uh, and I'm really excited because I think Abe Forsythe's doing the new RoboCop movie, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So it's pretty cool to see some up and coming directors this year really have some fun things on the horizon for us to look for. Uh, I think that just proves that we're in a very exciting time where, you know, we're getting some really extremely fun and new voices out there in the, uh, in the genre world. So you don't want to build a snowman. No, <laughs> not exactly. Um, but yeah, so I guess, um, do we have anything else? Have we covered all of our bases? There's, I know there's like 20 more movies we probably should mention, but you know, nobody we, needs to hear that. We can run that in the end credits. Like if we've got to mention, uh, yeah, just run it I'll super just, fast. Yeah. I'll just run, run over the whole list. Um, but yeah, so um, that is sort of our year in wrap up. Hopefully you guys, I mean, I know there's, there's so when you, everybody's doing lists, you know, and there's always sort of that overlap. So hopefully for those of you listening, we've given you some new things to sort of look for out there, um, you know, and sort of sh maybe introduce you to your new favorite movie that you don't even know yet. Um, but, you know, we do appreciate you listening each and every week um, for your news reviews, interviews and all that fun stuff. You can head over to DailyDead.com for everything uh, Corpse Club. You can find us over at CorpseClub.com or, of course, you could uh, tweet over at us on Twitter at Corpse Club and let us know what you think and what some of your favorite movies of 2019 were. Um, and you can also find out more information about how to join Corpse Club over on our website as well. Um, I must thank our engineer, Brian, um, for making us sound good, um, you know, as good as we can, I suppose. Uh, and for those of you listening, uh, until next time, stay scary.